a game oriented setting to kind of get you to a point where you actually have a demonstrable technology quicker. And you'll have something that's actually kind of primary pretty quickly. You'll soon be able to beat you, and, and if you put it up against their better opponents and keep dueling it, you'll find that it probably beats everybody you know. In a game setting, a computer is really a formidable opponent. The, the talk here, I will, for about 80% of it, uh, actually stick with what the paper was about. And it'll be uh, about the Scrabble programming and its data structure and things. Turns out it's harder to change hands than I thought they were getting pocket this <laughs> data exchanges. Um, the, about 20% of the paper, especially the last of it, because I'll be trying to build to it, will be about AI in general. Yeah, that's what inspired me to want to become a speaker here today, is because artificial intelligence as a possible way to become immortalized, I call it being embedded in silicon. Um, I'm hoping that I actually survive and disgrace to the advances in AI and making it possible to embed the human intellect in silicon before 2050, because at that point I'll be 89 years old, and if they can get me while I'm still reasonably intellectually coherent, I'll be happy to go into silicon for the rest of my whatever. <laughs> Just yesterday I was thinking, what if the power goes out? And then today I was thinking, what if they invent viruses that get into these silicon AI people? <laughs> the, the opportunity for genocide just by shutting off the power where people, millions of people are living in silicon. <sighs> but perhaps we're getting ahead of ourselves. We haven't got anybody invented in silicon yet. I got an interest in AI just about as soon as I got an interest in computers. Um, I went away to university in 1979, and I remember the very first week, orientation week, I went on a, a, a orientation week activity called Introduction to the Computing Facilities at MIT. And it was an organized uh, notion tour of all of the major facilities on campus where they showed you where they were and which programming languages they supported, what kind of students and what kind of grad students and such got jobs there. And I remember being shown a speech recognizer with a vocabulary of a hundred words in the MIT Architecture Machine Group, the predecessor to the Media Lab. Um, at the time, I hadn't even thought that computers would ever recognize speech. Uh, at the time, they weren't sure they would either. I heard it was pretty impressive and ambitious for a vocabulary. Um, now Siri probably has a vocabulary close to a quarter of a million words. But for 1979, 100 words of possible isolated speech recognition was pretty cool. Before I finished my undergraduate program, I'd been, I started working at the architecture machine group. Um, they did a program called Put That There, which put them pretty, made them pretty famous. They made it a set of uh, sorry, geometric, not architectural, geometric models, um, red cylinders and green cones and blue prisms and things. And you could say things like, put the green cone on the blue prism. It knew the words to put the green cone blue prism. They could fit that kind of a sentence into their hundred word recognizer. So a person could stand in the room, they used acoustic radar so that they had eight speakers in the room transmitting, so they knew where your hand was. They had a special reflective pointer. Um, so you could say, now put that red circle on that blue. And as you pointed, you knew what that was, because the word that comes up a lot. It also fits easily within the 100 computing, make a tremendous number of sentences with very few words. The computer history I kind of joined in 79 there. I mean, it had been pre-existing. Uh, I think of it as Dr. John McCarthy, who turned out so did Wikipedia. Uh, John McCarthy at MIT pretty much came up with the word in 1956, so it's only five years older than I am. And by the middle of the 1960s, one of his collaborator, uh, uh, co-workers, Joseph Eisenbaum had come out with this ELISA program that pretended to be a psychiatrist whenever you'd speak to it it would reverse the pronouns, so it would say, I'm feeling terrible, and it would say, you're feeling terrible? And they'd say, I have problems I can't deal with. And they'd say, earlier you said you were feeling terrible. And we would 
these stories and you said reverse the pronouns. All I could do was just these little lexical things that they put in front of lay people in the mid 60s. And many of them thought they were talking to psychiatrists on a teletype. They take four out their problems. <laughs> they feel better afterwards. <laughs> it was 200 lines of code. All I did was reverse the pronouns and repeat back things that had occurred before. But it passed very high at the time. Thank you, three, with my graduating year from university. I remember because I had a college roommate got one day I got on PCs off the press. He was my young summer employee the previous summer, so I had a connection. Um, he programmed up a game called Robot Miner. So by the time we were living together in the apartment, the summer after senior year, uh, when he'd go on vacation or something, I'd go to his room, turn on the computer, play all night, very addictive game. It was, again, game programming. Well, two robot miners were simulated with a game and a guy that would do things outside of the player. He would identify on whatever military or uh, resource management decisions they made. Back to the paper, uh, just so it fit into context. Um, Scrabble is actually much older than AI. Scrabble, approximately 38, when they started making this popular board game. Um, I suppose, I, I think Scrabble is as familiar to people as McDonald's. I don't know if it's that popular, but certainly it should be in the league with monopoly shoots and letters. Yeah. Um, so I don't have much in the way of uh, demonstrations of Scrabble. I'm just kind of presuming that, you know, it's words you put them on a uh, square board and you have those tiles. Um, the, the 38 and 48 area was it's, it's kind of when Alan Turing first made his computer. Um, the Imitation Game will give you a pretty good history as a movie for that era when nobody knew what a computer could do. And suddenly it was discovered they could do through the marvelous things like win World War II. Scrabble and computers kind of started the intersection after the advent of computer resources academia put some actually people on the earth, academic, trying to publish or perish tracks, into looking at it as a potentially tractable problem. The earliest I can find was somebody who got a cited peer review paper for a computer implementation of Scrabble is the 77. The second one there, um, it's in the references of the main paper of World Script, which is of the world's fastest Scrabble program. It's interesting because when I searched it up on the internet, it shows basically canvas home shots of a paper obviously printed on tractor feet with perforations along the edges. And you can tell that the dot matrix wasn't quite always up to snuff, so that some of the characters were brighter and some of the characters were dimmer. So this is back in the era when not everything was HTML. Some things were literally dot matrix printers because the only copy of this program. This paper, the world's fastest computer program, is, as I said, printed from May 88, so that gives you a sense of time, 28 years ago, nine year, or 11 years after the first one that I could find. Brian Shepard went on to become pretty famous in Scrabble history because his program, which he kept retooling and retooling and retooling. Got so good, Hasbro bought it, put in all kinds of toys. You can still find basically the program that made it fall into in almost every computer scramble that find online. The game of Scrabble is turn-based and is somewhat random because your rack will be random and is somewhat imperfect information because your opponent will have already drawn some tiles that you do not see. All of those little aspects are things that define the class of games that it's in. So it's not complete, it's not zero luck, there's some luck. It's not perfect information because there's some hidden information. And the goal, the best I can put it down to a single if you're going to write a program that will at least always play by the rules, 
you must always do this. Um, the second one does the dictionary in this way, you can consider for a candidate word, is actually a, a pretty fuzzy edge problem. Um, in most casual play, you put down a word, you say, is that a word? People you're playing with say, looks like a word to me. <laughs> so, I mean, if you, if you look up the dictionary, you can find that there's comic, and there's comical, and there's probably not going to be comically, and there's almost certainly not going to be comicliness, but all of these are photo words. <laughs> so, depending on how friendly your, your moments are, or the casualness of your play, the dictionary really is amorphous, and it's certainly what the computer's doing it. You can play with a 60 word dictionary, or a 6,000 word dictionary, or a 600,000 word dictionary. The computer doesn't mind it, just looking through a data structure, making it bigger, doesn't change the search problem at all. So, the dictionary part of the scramble, although it's the subject of many legal wrangles because people are fighting over the word lists, even now. Every time somebody makes a word list better, Somebody thinks that they ought to get some royalties. But I, I just can't bring myself to ever care about the dictionary. I call it vocabulary like, uh, building and version. I think that every time you play, you should put down a word you're not sure of the word in hopes that it becomes one. <laughs> and if your opponents won't agree that that's a word, then for your second half of your turn, you actually have to put one down that you think is a word. But every turn, you should find a invent a word. That's how I play scrambles. I get away with a lot of words. <laughs> and there are a lot of words that nobody knows. I put down two and one's T-O-O-N. That's not a word, that's just short for cartoon. So I said it might be a word. And I said that's not a word if it's just short for cartoon. So I said, look it up. Toon, one of the major wood export products of Australia. So nobody knows all of the wood export products of Australia. Always take a chance to put down some word that might be a word. That's my advice. The third point on this slide is the point that Scrabble is not just an endeavor to do on your turn what you can, the top line. It is better for you as a contestant to take into account what your opponent can do as well. So he can respond depending on what you have done. You've opened up opportunities or you've used up all your high scoring letters or you've left yourself with S's so you can pluralize any word he puts down. It's more there. And there's things like holding on to an I after you've seen him play an X so you can play his I, the Greek letter, or holding on to an O after you see a J, because Joe is a word, so you can reuse his high scoring letters. The, the paper that we're evaluating today, it didn't look into any of the adversarial advantage evaluation. It just looked at what it could do on its turn, oblivious to what else was happening in the game and in the data. So it had an index structure for the board, the data structure for its seven tiles in the rack. They were, it could have kept track of the distribution of letters that were going out of use, because after it's used on the board, it's certainly not coming out of the random sack when you're drawing replacement tiles. Um, but it just kept going back as well. It had a data structure for the dictionary, which has turned out to not be the key thing that made it so fast. Um, it made one reference in the paper to an interesting point that at the end of the game, when you have seen every letter that you've played, you've seen every letter that's still in your rack, you know that the bag of draw letters is empty. And by subtraction, you can figure out exactly what's in your opponent's remaining rack. So it became a game of perfect information at the end, and they thought that might be one of the best ways for them to extend the program beyond what they did do to try to really rack up the extra possible points by putting more computation in perfect information rather than the algorithm that they used and heuristics that they used throughout all the play when they didn't even bother to try to guess what their opponent had. As I mentioned, the, the things that the program tried to do, dictionary was really important to it, but they also, to their, 
guess that they're all did more with the data structure for the board and the data structure for the rack than anybody that they had the prior arch. The data structure for the board is pretty simple. It's only 17 by 17 matrix, 17 across 17 down to order, 80 times centers, star in the middle, where everybody starts. So the number, and even by the end of the game, most of it is still locked in. So 102 there, 102 down, so 280, sorry, 187 left. Empty squares even at the end of the game. So to model the data structure for the board was never going to be taxing on their resources. Um, they basically looked at the modeling of the board for how can we optimize this space be down because it's never going to be very big. For the rack, they realized that if you have duplicates of the letters, you don't have to say there's an A word here, how about the other A? So they implemented the ability to skip out some of the search by never trying the same letter in the same place, even if you had multiple copies of the letter. And again, as I mentioned, on non the letters, they didn't try to look at what's connected to the bag for a cross. They didn't try to think about what people know how to have. They described every one of their data structures for dictionary for the representation of the rack and the representation of the board in elaborate detail. And it was kind of fun to read. None of it seemed earth shaking, but I guess at the time, because most of it was probably unknown in prior art, I, I, I've only reread the paper recently. I don't remember my initial reactions back in 88, whether any of that sounded profound. But each of them is pretty understandable, and I think I'll be able to lay it out here. What they looked at was they wanted to be fast. Um, they were afraid that by the time they were done, if what they were doing was a lot of computation, they would end up with a game that made the opponents feel like, oh, this is blotting, this is slow, this is boring. Um, they ended up at 1.4 seconds per move. So they really did succeed in getting really, really fast. The evaluation of all the possible good words. This is going to get into some of the key optimizations they're using. The anchor was one of them. The anchor is where they're going to start looking that they might play this turn. In looking at that board, as I mentioned, the board was never going to be big, so they could arrange it any way they wanted. One key thing they realized is that sometimes you could say, well, maybe the word less would fit here with the T there. Or I could look over there and starting to tell where less could fit there. And it would be wasting their time if they looked from different places. The word could end up in the same place, starting with a T and working backwards or starting with L working forwards. So they invented a thing called the left anchor, which is the only place they will look for where the word will go. And it turns out that by defining the anchor in a very special way, the leftmost place adjacent to an existing tile. They never had to look for combining letters on the board with letters from the rack in the anchor. Because it turns out that if there are if there's a, uh, a tile here and a tile here, if there's some space in between, the only places you should start to look for the word are just to the left of the existing one or right of the existing one. If there was a good time to start looking you could instead go. <laughs> if there would have been a good time to start looking later in the word for a word that would fill in between here, you could instead just always start looking from here. So they got themselves some optimization by only ever looking from the leftmost place that the word could start, instead of looking every place the word could land, looking their way to the left. They did have to go after they pick a place where it might start. They have to look, well, can it start further left than this? Yes but only if you're supplying letters from your hand. But they never had to look supplying letters from your hand and some letters already on the board. My wife said, you'll never understand this without a diagram. And that might be true. But I think if you sit down with somebody, you'll see these words. And I'll put a presentation up on my website and link to it. You'll see that you don't have to look anywhere for a word that will contain both letters from the rack and letters on the board the left of the anchor. The dictionary, I might 
24,000 Twitter. 24,000 Twitter for your words. I think it was a pretty ambitious dictionary, especially by the time. I went to work for Dragon Systems in 1993. They were the speech recognition company trying to achieve human continuous speech recognition. And they did by about 1998, I guess, maybe 97. It's now let's say Siri. So now it's 20, 21 years later, it's really extraordinarily good continuous human speech recognition. Um, and they were with 56 languages. That's something we didn't have in the 90s. We were only five languages back then. English, French, Spanish, Italian, and German. I actually worked on the country in Dutch. It's going to be our sixth language. But the, the dictionary of words that you might consider um, is now, if you include what they call roots and endings, people are going to throw Lee and Ines on the end of all kinds of words, or take any almost any verb and, and add Ness to it. Um, there's about 750,000 in English in a typical speech recognizer's vocabulary now. But 1988, they didn't know how powerful the roots and endings technology would be. Even in Dragon, I think they didn't realize it. They jumped it up from 256,000 words that we had in that hand edited 256,000 line file. Like the line roots and endings ran up to 750,000. For Jacobson and Apple, they were all wordless. They used with about 780 kilobytes, which for them was prohibitively large. Because back then, core memory, the, the amount of RAM in the machine was 512 kilobytes. So they couldn't store all 780 kilobytes and look for ways to optimize for size. Where is the 96,000 Ah. Asynchronic word graphing. Okay, there's cool. So you got the whiteboard marker that I think there's one right yeah. there. Okay, yeah. Cool. Okay. Let's say that the three words that you have are all ale or ale. So you could represent this as an A could be followed by an L. And A can be followed by a B, a B is followed by an L, and an E and no other choices. An L is followed by an E or an L and no other choices. So you have this graph would represent these three words. But also realize that graph would represent these three words. Because the AL and ABLE end in exactly the same way, and there's no other ways to end them. If that's your whole word list. So the 19853 is that they took the 117,000 and did those kinds of optimizations. And it was, they were breathtaking. I mean, the language they used in the paper, they were just awestruck. So they got 80% of, of words and similar to other words. And that's been my experience working lexically in English as well, is that the endings of words in English. It's just kind of amazing how much reuse there is. I do things like reverse the dictionary front and back. So I'll represent able as E L B A, and then I out I sort the whole thing. And then I take out all the duplicate from the way. It's just kind of neat watching big tracks of the the, the, the language. And that you know, get 46,000 words in a row ending in BLE or things like that. So the language is incredibly uh, reused in its trailing end.
And they did say that the edge could be represented in 23 bits, which is kind of one bit less than 16 bit, so like 8 bit. Um, a sentence that they thought worthy of throwing into the paper, which was enough to bring it to the smile and not to laugh out loud. This small size allows us to keep an entire main core. Um, that one, I have a data structure with 175 kilobytes. That's typically like one Python instance. <laughs> I, I could toss thousands or tens of thousands and even hundreds of thousands if I'm willing to wait of instances of a single class of that size. But for them, that was the biggest data structure. That's most of what they were using in that form. The optimization of the rack, the seven letters that you have visible in front of you, and which are randomly chosen from the three drawing stack, is something that almost no one of their predecessors had ever bothered with. Um, it turns out that they couldn't exploit much out of it, but they did get a little bit. They discovered that if you at least alphabetize it, because the only question you're ever going to need to answer is, do you have another one of those to place in the square? But they never need to check the second A if the first A didn't work. So let's look at the candidate location and set of letters. If one of the letters didn't pay off, it was not going to be a good word. Checking for exactly the same word with a different A or a different end wasn't going to pay off either. The data structure for the rack, um, what you select it out, place it in the anchor, and then place it in the next square adjacent to the anchor. They keep track of which one they pulled out. The only time to access the rack data structure is to fill the anchor and then fill the next candidate, which is basically an out of an anchor. Because tentatively, the first filled anchor is now a tie on the board. already pre-computed. Uh, as soon as they violate 
the experience of uncomfortable layers that could land next to some of the tiles. They give up back up. So this is where they got listed speed by pre-computing for each empty square the very small number of letters that would form legal crossings if they went that way. They could throw out most words. Well, this is the this is the positioning of tiles from the wreck came to collision with that square. The other thing that they do is save time is they didn't ever look at the same question twice. If they had a tiles could be placed in the anchor, or tiles at successive anchors, anchor anchors. If they ever reach the point where it is not able to complete the word given what's there, then they don't have to try any other possibilities. It's never going to be possible to complete the word if it isn't possible to complete the word now. So that eliminates all of the longer words that they never had to check as soon as they found they couldn't complete. And then they use the, the idea of you're keeping track of it, placing the anchors recursively. And as you back out, you just remove the time that you most recently placed recursively. So they go through the process of trying all the possible places that they can place well, between one and seven tiles onto the board in a manner that as soon as something wasn't going to pay off, they got to eliminate all of the dictionary search that had started that way. So it's the first the checks were constrained because you only have seven available letters, some of the duplicates, and then the checks because you'll hit tiles for which, you'll hit empty squares for which it's been pre-computed that there's only a small number of characters that could be going in that alignment of anchors. I mean, when you first place an anchor, it's not clear whether you're going row or column. But as soon as you place the second anchor, it's clear which way you're going. So those were the data structure optimizations as they attempted to solve the, how to make my best move on the defender they put it up against. See how it would do it for the first degenerate case so that we have to have you and sit there and play against it. Although 22 moves at 1.4 seconds, it's only going to be playing for 28 seconds. Probably not going to get to innovation. But first they had to play against the simulated opponent that always has, which is a legal move in Scrabble, so that could be a legal Scrabble game. That would typically be able to evaluate to the optimal screen, optimal placement given this rack and board. 1.4 seconds. It would uh, average looking at 450 legal moves, deciding which of them is the best. And when it played 10 times against itself, each side would typically score an average 377 points. Now, I've played a lot of Scrabble games. Any Scrabble game with two players where I can beat 300 is a day of celebration. I've probably gone over 400 twice in my life. 377 is a Really creditable score. So they did at least devote some discussion to what if they did more than just try to make their turn as high scoring as possible. What to do if they look at the adversarial uh, e evaluation? They didn't implement any adversarial evaluation in the program, but they did. Calling it out as areas for future. One, they realized that that, that end game condition that I mentioned in one of the earlier slides. When the game becomes a game of perfect information, it's computationally practical to make the optimal move. So they thought one of the places that they might be able to squeeze out even a higher win percentage is if at that moment when the last tile is drawn from the draw bag, they now know exactly what their opponent. And from there, they should evaluate not just well, how can I make my turns high scoring, but how can I optimally beat that rack. And they realized that that will come in the end game. Um, typically, the last two turns of the game are after the last time they're drawn from the draw sack. So they could simulate doing that earlier. They can't do it all the time for the entire tree branching because it's too expensive. But they could simulate it. They could give the opponent a random hypothesized rack given the probabilities of tiles that they had not seen. And the 
Bush has come back. That's the fourth test comes out on the board. I'm going to change this couple weeks later because nobody's going to put our last season in anymore. That's the second. Mike comes out on the board. I'm going to change this completely because, uh, you know, they're not going to be substituting an extra good driver with their butt. So there are ways to simulate the effect of the randomness changing both of the length of the game. As all of them, as more of the tiles come into view, some of the tiles that appear will be shifting what you're strategically best off to. Now the this talk, but not that big term, this talk is going to shift in terms of what I want to make clear to you as an audience. The in 1988, back compared against what you would typically buy from a uh, tiger direct. Um, you'll get something with a 900 times faster clock. They tend, of course, you'll be running on a, a Pentium or i386 or an i586 where they've optimized the microcode. And you get a terabyte where they have 40 gig, sorry, 40 meg. Um, on our RAM, you probably get, even in Silicon, you might even get as much as half a terabyte, and they have 512 k Despite the fact that these numbers are huge and you think, well, it's going to be that much better, it was not actually the speed up of capacity or the CPU time that made such a difference in my Maven and modern 2016 era. I, it, game made eyes are better. It's almost entirely the software. And these seem like really big numbers, but they're small compared to how fast or how much of an impact it can have to make a better software algorithm. So virtually everything that you've seen where over time computers have gotten more realistically intelligent or have a higher uh, win rate against world-class opponents in games, it's all about the software. That's not just Scrabble. Um, the software side in virtually every discipline, and especially now with the discovery of deep learning and the ability to nearly network represent knowledge that you gain from uh, training mode to use it in test or production mode. Um, it's not always the case that even the developers or the uh, users of the computer understand why it is that the network trained so well as it did. Um, some software aspects of problems that we're solving in our Massive computation are being solved in ways that are just beyond the edge of what we comprehend, how it's achieving the results it is. This paper, they never used the word intelligent, not even once. They only talked about fast, but they only talked about computer. Um, it was me as a reader who saw it as an artificial intelligence endeavor to make a scrabble play program because. In some sense, I think of myself as an intelligent Scrabble playing program, and my mother is well, because she's who I mostly learned to play against. Um, also, all of my girlfriends and all of my girlfriends' mothers Scrabble has had a long and enduring uh, test of wit and acumen in social situations all my life. The authors did a almost all almost all of that first one is, quote, they didn't want to make any claims that it was a good program, but they did want to acknowledge they had found a way to make a blindingly fast program. And so finally it moved it out of Ford's era, a theoretical sort of paper programming concept into an interactive real-time actual gameplay experience that was plausible and enjoyable. You never had to wait for this thing in 1.4 seconds per move. Had to play this for this any frame of time. So they described it as enough for resounding victories over almost all human players in this space. And I'm pretty sure they didn't just pick slackers. I'm pretty sure <laughs> it 
it was doing something that especially got them computers do so many interesting things. Which it doesn't seem all that intelligent. It was working in a constrained space. That the things they'd have to look for are they probably only number it the one or ten of the thirty-six possible things they could have done on the board. But by grouping it's getting it down to only looking at four hundred and fifty legal words per room. So it was such a constraint space by the rules that what it was doing was not in a sense all that impressive as intelligence. Perhaps she wants to expect something more general. Mm -hmm. Another thing that made it seem not quite so intelligent is everything that the the authors did everything that their coders did was specifically just to try to meet the rules of Scrabble and the limitations of the non-human architecture computer program. They didn't try to do anything creative or inspiring or with any kind of an emotional impact at all. They just tried to fit the constraints. And in my experience as a programmer and as an architect of programs and systems, I've come to hold a kind of disdain about programming for a game compared to programming for what I call worthwhile problems. Because in a game, the rule-based essence of the game, that's why it seems to be kind of entertaining to play your crash your wits against another person in this constraint set, the things that make it a game, they tend to all cause game AI, the implementations of things to seem like a human playing it that way. To feel like all you're doing is coding against constraints. I actually read that probably not even in my lifetime will a game AI ever be so good that it will survive the scrutiny after people's hard work help was done without being dismissed as, oh, that's not intelligent. That was just compensation. And it's an interesting, crashing thing. I mean, as it does more and more amazing things, as it starts to win at the stock market, as it starts to make better policy or uh, uh, legislative decisions. I mean, maybe the way I bet is that you don't see profound like Socrates or Simon or Solomon. But as each one is done, then look at how it's done. If it was against a constraint set of rules like the tax code or even against the body of all legislation, I think people will always have kind of chip on their shoulder about the AI. If you're optimizing against an arbitrary set of rules, just won't feel intelligent like people. I've watched gamification come into flower these last few years. I've been in, intrigued. It's, uh, for the same reason I've liked Scrabble all my life. It, it struck me as it would be kind of fun to have gamification on more and more aspects of our lives. I've seen gamification for sales contests and for doing your Clinical chairs like getting your timesheets in or making your vacation requests. Um, my wife and I play Antibetica for things like uh, eating less junk food and more food, um, for paying each other compliments. What are some of the bizarre things that I do with Antibetica daily? Well, um, if I work on the highest priority project, it's the procrastinating, I get a point for that. It doesn't have to be any specific thing on a given day, it just has to be the thing that I'm most inclined to procrastinate on. But very similar to anything which is a game or a legislative system or a set of rules, gamification will tend to feel a little bit constrained and arbitrary. The rules were not natural, the rules were not open ended. You get something for pretty arbitrary reason. And sometimes you say, woohoo. <laughs> so one of our famous Greek myths with gamification turns into a pleasurable daytime activity for Sisyphus. As I spoke so deprecatingly of AI or game AI, there's another side of me that I hinted at by calling something worthwhile problems. Um, I think there are going to be worthwhile problems. And I think AI is progressing so rapidly now and the sophistication of software and hardware advances that we're actually probably going to see some indistinguishable from intelligence, intelligence 
Um, this is my personal favorite, with the realization that I talk pretty frequently, and I know even more people who, who have more problems with customer support with a modulating telecommunication signal coming out of South India. They're talking to a customer service rep who's fixing their bill or adding another service on the ladder or, or dealing with something on their piece of account or applying or something, making an order for some kind of online service or online product. Human beings are interacting with a modulating telecommunication signal and I think all of us who've done it, I presume we're talking to an intelligence. But it's not going to be that hard. It's easy to foresee a time when the computer can modulate a telecommunication signal, seeming to be a human voice, seeming to have heard what you just said, and seeming to respond appropriately. The way that I think it's been held off in recent times more than it needed to be is the lack of realization that in all real human to human interactions, people say, excuse me, or can you repeat that, or, or I didn't get that, or did you say that? And, and timing. Programmers seem to be really oblivious to timing being a key consideration as to when something seems realistic and natural. But I think as people step up to this, just interrupting the right frequency, a natural and human frequency, Asking for repetition or repeating back things you said just to sound like you're interested in what the person said. I actually, I don't think we have even 10 years before all telecommunication customer support reps are computers that just happen to sound like human beings. And in furtherance of that, uh, that's where I'm heading. The, my favorite meetup that I've not primarily, just this is what else I do at you know, if I go to the Toronto AI Express. This is uh, I hear Watson has put up a four and a half million dollar prize pool to be awarded in 2020 to the top three teams who solve an artificial intelligence problem. And I think there are solvable artificial intelligence problems. I look up at the Toronto chapter, I'm not sure that they're interested in chatbots or psychiatry are exactly aligned with my interests in uh, telecommunications, customer service reps, but we started off sufficiently similar. I'm sure that they're going to want their clients talking, and I'm going to want my clients talking. I'm not sure that they're going to presume or sorry, be perceived as understanding what the human has said. I'm certainly going to expect my customer service reps to be perceived as understanding what the human had said. So my contribution of working on the dialogue and on the naturalness of interacting across the telephone, and even from my experience knowing about signal, when you introduce some noise and you feel like it's 25,000 miles away or it bounced off a couple satellites, these actually enhance the illusion. So I'm not going to make it sound crisp and clear like you're talking to a computer with a fabulous sound system. I'm going to take advantage of the fact that it should sound like you're talking to crappy telecoms about another continent. So it's another meetup, the Trump Artificial Intelligence. They've had one meeting so far, they'll probably have meetings monthly. And that final URL is Watson XPRIZE, Description of Competition Guidelines. If you're interested in solving an important world problem, I certainly encourage you to go there.
How do you know Genesis? 